Hello. The least abundant human resource in the world today is leaders and managers capable of continuously transforming societies and business organizations to flourish in the world of tomorrow. Everyday newspapers report more corporate mergers and restructuring. Every day thousands of lives are altered by these changes. Most of us who manage people, however, do not have the tools and experience to effectively work through such transitions. This program has been produced for all of us in today's organizations, where change is necessary to revitalize and improve performance. Leading change in the global economy addresses the fact that it is people who have to carry out the change. We'll not only talk about what should be done, but also how to do it, giving all of you who lead and manage practical ways to bring people on board. By the end of this program, you will look at future changes in a new way, and perhaps even look forward to change as a real opportunity. The language of change. Everybody talks about managing change and resistance to change. But we're going to talk about what is going on inside the people who have to make the change work. We will provide a real sense of the emotional impact of change and what can be done to keep it from disrupting the entire organization. Think of a recent change at your workplace. Remember the words and phrases that you heard or used most often that characterized people's reactions to the change, both your reaction and other people's reaction. Consider what people say that captures their thinking, feeling, and behaviors. What does our language reveal about our mindset, about change? What are our limiting organizational beliefs about change? We used to say that significant change is always a possibility. Today, we assert that significant change is a certainty. Often the changes you have to implement are important to the success or survival of your organization. They aren't the, it would be nice if we could do it, or the, do it if you can get around to it kind of changes. They will probably involve the new technology the company needs to be competitive. The new structure the organization needs to be effective. The reduced cost levels required to be profitable. In the global economy, change is not an option. It has become the name of the game. If you and your organization cannot deal with change effectively, you aren't likely to be around very long. All of the talk about helping people cope with change may strike you as unnecessary. You may think of yourself as a kind of person who tells people what to do, and they do it. Well, maybe this used to be true. Maybe they used to do it. Today, in the global economy, simple, unquestioning compliance is offered less and less often. For one thing, change happens so frequently today that one change isn't complete before another is being launched. Misguided management gurus tell us we must thrive on chaos, but very few of our employees show much inclination to engage in a constantly chaotic environment. The modern competitive global marketplace allows little margin for error. Constant chaos introduces the probability of error into organizational systems. You may be the kind of person who is trying to avoid the difficulties of leading and managing change because the people side of things isn't your thing. You may believe that you're better at the task side of the equation, at getting the product out the door, or crunching the numbers, or making sure that the information is in the right place at the right time, than you are at managing the human beings who are being asked to make changes. You may think that because you don't have the training or skills of a psychologist, you shouldn't have to deal with how people feel about change. That's personal stuff. Besides, you just want to get results. Well, we can empathize with you. But a decade of working with people who are doing their best to cope with change has taught us a thing or two about the process. We have good news and bad. First, the bad. You simply cannot get the results you need without getting into that personal stuff. To implement change, 
You have to get people to stop doing things the old way and have them start doing things a new way. There is no way to do this impersonally. The good news is you don't need a degree in psychology to lead people through the sometimes stormy waters of continuous change. You already have many of the abilities you need, and the process we are about to take you through will allow you to apply the skills you have now and develop the additional ones you need. Introducing the change loop. This is a process model that captured the wisdom from many authors, including Cotter, Bridges, Porras, and some others, and to guide us through leading and managing change. The change loop maps key areas of concern as we move from the way things are to the way things need to be in the desired future state. This passage from where we are to the successful future we want is called a transition. To lead change, we must successfully manage transitions. This is an important idea. Change is not the same as transition. Change is situational. The new location, the new boss, the new role, the new policy. Transition is the emotional process people go through to come to terms with the new situation. Change is external, transition is internal. Unless transition occurs, change will not work. Important differences between change and transition are overlooked when we think of transition as simply gradual or unfinished change. When we talk about change, we naturally focus on the outcomes that the change will produce. And we have absolutely have to have a compelling vision of what our desired future looks like. In other words, we must start with the end in mind. Transition is different. The starting point for transition is not a focus on the outcomes that the change will produce, but the ending you will have to make to leave the current situation behind. Situational change focuses on the new thing. Transition focuses on letting go of the old reality and the old identity and the old way of doing things. Transition starts with an ending. Paradoxical, but true. Verify this in your own experience. Recall a big change in your life. The time you got a promotion from individual contributor to manager. Or the birth of your first child. Or moving to a different house in a different city. And let's assume that these are all good changes for you. As transitions, each one of them started with an ending. With the promotion, you may have had to let go of your old peer group. They weren't peers anymore. As an individual contributor, you may have felt highly competent. And as a new manager, you may have felt uncertain and less secure about your ability to perform and achieve successful outcomes. With the arrival of the new baby, you've left behind the freedom and the spontaneity of being able to go somewhere whenever the two of you felt like it. And you had to let go of an interrupted sleep. With the move to a new house in a different city, a whole network of relationships ended. Even if you kept in touch, it was never quite the same. You also left behind knowing where to go to get groceries, health services, and most of the logistical needs of everyday life. You left behind the feeling of being at home, at least for a while. Even with good changes, there are transitions that begin with having to let go of something. And these are losses, because these are endings. The failure to identify and be ready for the endings and the losses that change produces is the first and most significant obstacle organizations must manage through when implementing change. The organization may institute a quality program without anybody who is trying to lead the change understanding that many people will experience improvement as a loss of something related to what they value about their job. As you consider a change that needs to be implemented, do begin with the end in mind. What does success look like? Develop a compelling vision which will engage people's hearts and minds and move their feet. And engage with them in the creation of the vision and then they will own it too. It is challenging for people to feel ownership if they don't have authorship. 
Next, develop a clear understanding of what is changing and what is not changing. Ask people, what are the things we do well we must carry forward into our future? People will move much more readily to the future if they can take the best of what works from the past with them to the future. Next, you must deal with what will be left behind and analyze who may experience losing what. This following chart will provide you with a starting place. Of course, the only way to build a chart accurately is to talk to the people. What you consider or experience as a loss may be totally different to what another person may perceive or experience as a loss. Reach out and seek to understand other people's view of the world. Ask them what matters to them. Ask them what concerns they have as we all move forward with the change. Remember, the perception and experience of loss is accompanied by the experience of fear. The greater the perceived risk of loss, the more intense the experience of fear. If the general level of fear present in the organization goes high enough, people's ability to perform will deteriorate. The change initiative will stall and you may not be able to get it going again. Ask people what their worst fears in the matter are and build a list. You are likely to learn about real risks that will have to be managed. As people tell you about their concerns and fears, also ask them what solutions they can offer to ensure a successful transition to the future you want. You are now headed down to the bottom of the change loop. You can think of this area as a no man's land or a neutral zone because some of the old ways are lingering on and the new ways have not all been developed. Lacking clear systems and signals, the neutral zone is a chaotic time, but this can create the space for creative opportunity. Your task here is twofold. First, to get your organization through in one piece, and second, to capitalize on the confusion by fostering innovation. Here are some things you can do to provide structure and strength during a time when people are likely to feel lost and confused. Work at protecting people from further changes while they're trying to regain their balance. You won't always succeed, of course. The regulatory environment may change. Your main competitor may change the game by introducing a new product line or head of your division may be replaced. Many changes can be delayed as part of an overall plan to manage the rate of change. When this cannot be done, you may be able to cluster the new changes under a heading that places them in context with the other changes you're going through. People can deal with a lot of change if it is coherent and they see it clearly as part of the big future picture. On the other hand, unrelated and unexpected changes, even if they seem trivial, can be the proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back. Set short-range goals for people to aim towards and to establish checkpoints along the road to successful future outcomes. This is a time when people can get discouraged easily. A lot of the time, nothing worthwhile seems to be happening when you're at the bottom of the change loop. So it is especially important to give people a sense of achievement and of movement by setting and reaching short-term goals. This will help counter the feelings of being lost and of self-doubt that often show up in the neutral zone. The temptation is to attempt to quickly push through this phase. Mistake. We're not suggesting that you let it take forever, but rather that you're thoughtful about the maximum rate of forward motion that can be sustained. Avoid setting people up for failure by setting unrealistic goals at the bottom of the change loop. Everyone loses when you fail to reach inappropriately ambitious goals. Find out what team leads and managers need to learn to function effectively during the transition and then provide training programs so that they can acquire the knowledge and develop the skills they need. This is a time to communicate and communicate and communicate. Give people information. Inform them of the purpose of every change. Keep painting the picture of what success looks like. 
Let them know how we plan to get there. Let each person know what their part in the plan is, what it is that they need to do differently. Keep looking for ways to keep their hearts and minds engaged. Think of this as the four P's. Communication that clarifies. Purpose. What's the purpose? What's the problem we are solving? Picture. What does success look like? Plan. How will we get there? Part. What do I want you to do differently? As you lead and manage change, it is vitally important that your words and actions match. As Jerry Porras, co-author of the classic business book bestseller, Built to Last, tells us, don't believe words, only believe behaviors. In the midst of a change process, people are watching. If you talk the new talk, but you're walking the old walk, people will also keep walking the old walk and your change initiative will be dead in the water. As you are on your way to your vision of the future, keep mapping actions and behaviors to the change loop. Let's walk through this example. Moving up from the bottom of the change loop, pay attention to the elements of the organizational system that are likely to drag people back to the past and the old ways of doing things. If you tell me how a man is measured, I will tell you how we will behave, as a quote that applies here. Make sure you align the measurement systems of the organization to the behaviors necessary to successfully arrive at your vision of the future. For example, participation in the global economy often requires the creation of globally dispersed high performance teams. In the past, measurement and reward systems in your organization may have been designed to acknowledge outstanding individual contributors. If you don't change the measurement systems to recognize and reward great teamwork, you won't get great teamwork. Now you're moving forward towards your vision of success. Make sure you celebrate the successful footsteps along the way. Celebrating success gets you more success in the future. We have seen teams of people come together and achieve rapid change using this change loop model. Typically, they will all get in the room together and have the conversations they need to have, mapping each set of conversations to each phase of the loop. The team will figure out that a big change is made up of lots of smaller changes. Then they have the conversations they need to have mapped to the change loop for each of the smaller changes. The first set of conversations may take half a day or even more. But by the time the team tackles the last of the smaller changes, the set of conversations may only take half an hour. Team members will then go forth and make it happen. We human beings tend to consistently overestimate what we can accomplish in the short term. And so we keep coming up short, pun intended. Consequently, we actually underestimate what we can achieve in the long term. The hero's journey is a saga of change. Work the change loop. You and your people can be organizational heroes. Uh, let's, <clears throat> let's begin with the uh, first question and answer session. We will try to answer as many questions as possible. Therefore, we ask that only one question be asked per phone call and that these questions be as brief as possible. You may call the studio directly at the phone numbers or fax which appear on your screen. We'll remind you to make your phone calls at a distance from the monitor to avoid feedback. Uh, for our first question, we go to Santo Domingo. Go ahead, please. Change is very fast in any organization. However, in government, it's usually very slow. What can we do to try to make changes in government a bit faster? Ah, yes. So uh, speed is a, is a very difficult uh, goal to achieve. So smoother is probably perhaps better than faster, and smoother gets you to faster. And smoother is where you get to if you have high-quality conversations, if you have high-quality dialogues. Uh, the word dialogue literally means a flow of meaning. So when we have a high-quality dialogue, 
we all arrive at shared understandings and shared meanings. And then people's fears are dissipated. And when the fear is dissipated, things do go faster. Uh, it's a lot of work, but it is the thing to do. Great. Thank you. For our next question, I believe we go to Lima, Peru. Go ahead, please. Hello, this, we're calling from the University Ricardo Palma from Lima, Peru, and our question is the following. I believe that the transition concept is especially important when we have permanent changes in our organizations. However, many bureaucratic organizations, both in government and education sectors, tends to change and then go back to the old when they have changes in the director level. So what could you tell us about this? Could you enlighten us a bit with these concepts? Uh, so two things. What gets changed to stall is people's fears that have not been addressed. Uh, people don't change because they feel the change is uncomfortable, is uh, disconcerting. They're not emotionally attracted to the change. They can perhaps rationally justify it, but emotionally it's a threat to them. So you have to deal with that. If you deal with that, uh, then the next thing you've got to do, if you've got a change taking in place, is you've got to change the measurement system, and we talked about that briefly. But what we uh, acknowledge people for, what we appreciate them for, what we like about them, what we thank them for, these are all ways of thinking about the measurement system. It's not just literal metrics, but it can be what we make important. So if you change what matters in the organization, you change what you talk about, you change what you invest meaning in, you change what people appreciate it for and are welcomed for, then that will institutionalize the change. People want to feel that they're succeeding, and if they're being rewarded for new behaviors, they'll feel like they're succeeding, they'll keep doing the new things. Thank you. Our next question is from Sinaloa, Mexico. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning. In the educational organizations, the changes isn't just necessary, but they are adamant. So how can we implement changes without really shaking too many feathers in the government that really opposes these changes? Um, so being political, and that's uh, amazing to hear me say that because <laughs> I'm not really that way, but you have to be a realist and say, don't go out of your way to upset people. Sometimes when we're young and we're obsessed with our ideas and our ideals and a compelling future that we all think matters, we tend to go out of our way to upset people, to make a point, to announce our nonconformism and our radicalism. This is a bad idea. I think that we have to be uh, go about it respecting the past and to say, you know, we got the way we are because we got the way we are, and some of it was wonderful and some of it wasn't. Embrace what was wonderful and move on, and that's a continual process. I think that whenever you alienate a group of people by having them feel that they were criticized and marginalized in terms of their importance and their relevance, then you end up with resistance, and that stops the change. So I think be thoughtful, considerate, welcome all people with uh, respect and warmth, and try to include them in the process rather than alienate them. Okay, great. Uh, now, uh, we, uh, let me uh, pose a question that uh, was faxed to us uh, from Medellin, Colombia, uh, and hear how the question goes. When we implement change in organizations, quite often we modify some of the things that we have been doing up to now, keeping at the same time others intact. In other words, we superimpose the new to the old. Does the change loop model take this into account? Yes, we talked about what to do in that bottom of the change loop as you cycle down. And that's where you have the richest conversations. It's the most unsettling part. It's the most turbulent part. But it's a time where if you reach out to people and you're in a space of appreciation rather than of judgment and criticism, people will be open. And the most important thing really is to identify the things from the past that really worked. There's lots of things in the past that worked well. But because we're wired up to manage by negative exception in this world, actually we're genetically engineered to do that, we tend to do that in all other parts of our life. And uh, it's a terrible recipe for successful change. 
people will not move to the future unless there's some emotional comfort along the way. And to have that emotional comfort, you've got to get them to appreciate what they've done well and to have them take that with them. And then on that foundation, you start to make all the things that are new, and then it's an adventure rather than a, a threatening journey. Great. Thank you for that response. Uh, we go to New Mexico for our next uh, question. Go ahead, please. Buenos días. My question is the following. What phase of the change loop do you think is the most difficult and the most costly in practice? Thank you. Well, my experience is that the most uh, difficult, pain, difficult part of the change loop is that bottom of the loop. It's those conversations where everything seems to have been turned upside down. We're not clear about the future. Uh, we're not satisfied with the past. Uh, we have some fear that we're failing. We have some fear that we're never going to get it together again. This is not so easy. And if you don't get it handled, the change never works. You've got to take the time, and it sometimes seems an inordinate amount of time, to have the conversations with the people, to understand their view of the world, to understand what's threatened, to understand what their fears are, understand their concerns, and most of all, understand their dreams and what they want in the future. And this is costly because it takes time. It's difficult because people aren't always used to speaking openly about what matters to them most. To get people to speak with open hearts and to have authentic conversations is not so easy. You need skilled facilitation and great compassion. We have to welcome people with great respect and warmth into the conversation, uh, be empathetic in the conversation, have them understand that we are concerned about their worldview and that we are sympathetic to it, and then from there start to collectively build a richer future. You have to take the time to do this. Thank you. Um, our uh, next question was faxed to us uh, from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and here it goes. Uh, should organizational change and transitions be implemented from top at the executive level to bottom, operational level always, and if so, why? Uh, no, not always. So a couple of things we've learned about change. We find that work groups or individuals in an organization will see areas that desperately need change that have not yet filtered up or percolated up to be clear to their senior management. What we have learned also is that generally senior management has to send messages to the organization that change is supported. People have to be rewarded for taking the risks. People, when they do changes that don't always work out immediately, have to be supported, not punished. So we have to celebrate the successes. We have to create an environment or a climate, as we call it, that's favorable to change and have it supported. So that being said, if that's met, those conditions of support culturally are met, then change can happen anywhere in the system. Major changes, if you're going to change the whole system, they generally have to come down from the top. And uh, if you create that culture of change, uh, what factors uh, do you need to cultivate so that you also receive information from bottom up? Um, I think you have to make it safe for people to communicate bad news. You know, sometimes we kill the messenger. <laughs> you can't do that. You if you kill the messenger, That's you right. kill the change. Yeah. Uh, and I think you've got to celebrate failures. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and see what we call failures as just another learning opportunity and milestones on the way to success. So I think if you do those two things, then people get the message, change is okay. Great. Thank you. Um, let's now move to the second module of our program.